Hello and welcome to the Ask the Expert event today. We will be learning about climate change with expert David Abel. I'm Indy Todd from CAI. Thanks to everyone that joins is joining us today, including our Leadership Circle and Ralph Lowell Society members. Uh, we appreciate your continued generous support. <clears throat> we also want to thank the World Channel for their support of this event. And before we get started, I'd like to introduce the team behind the event. They'll be pulling the strings and connecting with you, but you will not see or hear them. First up is my colleague, Bailey. Bailey is our event producer. Hi, Bailey. Hi, Mindy. Thank you so much for the introductions. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our Climate Change Ask the Expert event. We're so excited to have you here and David. Um, please let us know if you have any questions. And again, we can't hear or see you, but you can hear and see us. We hope you enjoy the event. Back to you, Mindy. Thanks. And Ileana will be keeping an eye on our Q&A tab. Ileana. Hi, thank you for that introduction, Mindy. I'm Ileana and I'll be hanging out in the Q&A tab. So if you have a question, you can um, submit it by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Please let us know where you're tuning in from before you submit your question. And if you see a question you want to hear the answer to, you could vote for it by giving it the thumbs up. Thank you so much for enjoying uh, joining us and we hope you enjoy the event. Now back to you, Mindy. Thanks. And to turn on the closed captioning feature, click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. Two transcription display options will pop up. We recommend that you select the subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of your screen. You can also select full transcript. A sidebar window opens where you can see what each speaker is saying. Uh, please bear in mind that closed captioning might be slightly delayed. Without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce David Abel. David Abel is a Pulitzer Prize winning reporter who covers fisheries and environmental issues for the Boston Globe. His work has also won an Edward R. Murrow Award, the Ernie Pyle Award from the Scripps Howard Foundation and the Sigma Delta Chi Award for feature reporting. He's co-directed and produced Sacred Cod, a film about the collapse of the iconic cod fishery in New England, which was broadcast by the Discovery Channel in spring of 2017. His other films include Lobster War, Gladesman and The Last of the Sawgrass Cowboys. He began learning to make films as a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University. He is Entangled's director, producer, writer, and director of photography. Welcome, David. Good to see you. Happy to be here with you today. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you uh, to everyone in the uh, GBH world for organizing this event, and uh, I'm really happy to be with you all. And we should mention that uh, yesterday, Entangled was broadcast on GBH's World Channel, so it's it's out there for people to see. <laughs> uh, one of the questions I, I'm thinking about, you know, we hear a lot about the um, conflicts between lobster fishermen and their gear and what's happening with the whales. Has there, where do we stand currently in the debate? Um, have has there been any middle ground reached between the lobstermen and those looking to protect the whales? Yeah, um, so the film gets into this and uh, I encourage everyone uh, listening in uh, to uh, watch the film, but it's all uh, ultimately about how climate change has accelerated this collision between uh, what is one of the world's most endangered species, the North Atlantic right whale, and uh, our um, the nation's most valuable industry, fishing industry, uh, the, uh, the lobster fishery. And, um, and over the course of the last two years, there has been an effort to bridge the divide uh, between conservationists and the fishing industry. And it all came together, uh, it all um, happened as part of this federal effort known as the Atlantic Large Whale Take Reduction Team. And two years ago, um, there was a, a group, this group came together um, and was tasked by the National Marine Fisheries Service to find um, some common ground with the goal of trying to reduce the risk of mortality and serious injury to uh, this critically endangered species, the right whale, uh, by between 60 and 80 percent. And they came um, together uh, and came up with what seemed to be a historic agreement. And all but one of the members of this team uh, agreed to, among other things, eliminate roughly half of all um, uh, vertical buoy lines, the lines that lobstermen use that go from the surface to the sea floor uh, that are the chief cause of mortality and, um, and serious injuries to right whales, and that is entanglement in fishing gear. And uh, to make a long story short, uh, the, um, the lobstermen in Maine 
as well as the congressional delegation in Maine decided after agreeing to uh, these um, uh, uh, to eliminate roughly half of their fishing lines, um, they backed out and started lobbying the Trump administration. And that caused a massive, uh, roughly year long or longer delay in the implementation of these rules. And they remained in some kind of regulatory black hole for much of the past year. And they weren't released till the end of the year, um, uh, the last day of last year. And then they had to go through a comment period. And by court order, they are supposed to be um, uh, the, the final rules are supposed to be released next month. Uh, but there's still, you know, potential lawsuits on the horizon and um, lawsuits that are still playing out. So we'll see what ultimately yeah, happens. It gets complicated. If you have a question for David, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen, type in your question there. You see a question you want to hear answered, vote for it by uh, clicking the thumbs up. Uh, these, these are such magnificent creatures. And I'm kind of wondering if before you started working on this film, had you been close up? Because you know, we have, you know, federally, you can't get close to them unless you're with somebody who has that federal license. Although there are places uh, along the Cape and uh, that you can actually see them pretty close from shore. So I wondered what your experience with them was before you did the film. So as a reporter at the Boston Globe, uh, who covers the environment? I've actually been I've been writing about uh, this species, the North Atlantic right whale, for years, and uh, but I, I had never actually I'd been on whale watches uh, with the New England Aquarium, uh, but I'd never actually had the privilege to see a right whale up close. Um, and um, it, as and you're right, you can see them from shore sometimes if you if you're lucky and you're in the right spot. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that the, the right whale is also known as the urban whale, um, because they historically uh, um, feed close to shore. And we even some of our footage was shot from shore. Uh, there was um, a photographer up in Gloucester who was literally standing on the on a on a jetty and he basically, you know, was filming them from from land. Uh, and yeah. you can see them from Cape Cod, from Provincetown, other other places. Uh, but I was immensely privileged to uh, spend time with a bunch of scientists and um, and got to see them up close, uh, alive and unfortunately dead. Um, and one of uh, sort of the most powerful moments I had was after um, after years of writing about this species and and seeing them in the wild, um, I had heard about the first right whale to die in 2019 um, when we started shortly after we started filming, and um, and it was being brought to this beach in a uh, on a, on a remote island of uh, um, New Brunswick on the Acadian coast of New Brunswick, and I had to. Uh, I had less than 24 hours notice, and so I had to get on a plane and fly to, I think, Ottawa, then Toronto, then um, uh, then I think Moncton, New Brunswick, and or F Fredericton. I I'm not even sure the town. And then I had to, and we didn't get there till like midnight. And then I had to drive three and a half hours with a colleague up to this remote island. And to make a long story short. Uh, we arrived before anyone else did, and just as dawn was breaking, we saw the whale, um, um, basically this massive school bus sized animal that I'd been writing about and, and uh, learning so much about and making this film about. And all of a sudden, there I was uh, alone with the exception of a Boston Globe photographer with me. And it was just this amazing sort of holy experience where I got to commune and in some way with this with this incredibly beautiful creature um, that was all alone uh, on this beach with waves crashing uh, into its mm. baleen. So it was a really powerful moving moment yeah. for me. Uh, we're gonna go start with some questions. Elizabeth says, what is happening with ropeless lobster fishing? So, um, you know, there are a lot of really 
difficult problems in this world uh, that have no easy solutions. Um, the, the decline of the North Atlantic right whale, which has seen its population uh, plummet by more than 25% in just uh, the past decade, um, is not one of those problems that has no clear solution. Um, the solution is us. We have been responsible for every time there has been a cause of death of a right whale um, that could be determined uh, over the last 20 or so years, it has been because of human beings, either entanglement in fishing gear or ropeless fishing. Uh, I, I'm sorry, entanglement in fishing gear or, sh or vessel strikes. Right. Next thought. Um, uh, they're, they're, the solutions to those problems are speed limits, uh, um, shipping lanes, um, you know, making sure mariners who are in vessels are aware of uh, the presence of right whales. And then there are either closures or reduced strength um, uh, fishing lines that, that break at certain pressures. And then of course, there is this new technology called ropeless fishing that uh, has come a long way in recent years. Um, I, I would say it's still in somewhat of a formative state where you know, there are still technical hurdles, uh, but it has been shown uh, repeatedly that you can activate a um, trap on the bottom, inflate uh, either kind of balloon or a bag of rope and, and, and bring it back to the surface, whole trawl lines worth of lobster traps. And this technology is being used in different parts of the world. We know it, it's not uh, high, um, high pie in the sky kind of technology. However, uh, to deploy it on a um, you know massive scale across thousands of fishermen who have fished in a certain way for generations is um, is not easy. Um, mm -hmm. And to make a long story short, uh, at, at, the, at, at the moment, the cost is just insurmountable uh, for any one lobsterman to, uh, to take on. However, um, with economies of scale, uh, uh, with more competition, with, the, um, with increased um, uh, deployment of the technology, and hopefully eventually, with some kind of federal incentive program or, or federal subsidies, uh, the transition of this fishery uh, is within the realm of reason. And we've already seen, you know, uh, trillion dollar rescue packages and, and infrastructure packages. So it's not uh, very far out of the realm of reason that we might be able to, you know, pay to, uh, to make a fishery work um, and also protect this critically endangered species. And Janet has a question kind of alluding to that. She says the film and the issue are so devastating, but there seemed to be a glimmer of hope from smelt.org and its inflatable fishing gear. Any chance of approaching a big funder like the Gates Foundation or Pew Trust to provide money for grants to assist those in the lobster industry to implement this alternative technology? Um, that's a great idea. And uh, um, I know that there are uh, there are groups that are trying to do that, and there are grants. The uh, federal government has provided grants to smelts, uh, which was featured in the film, and other um, uh, and other groups. And you know, the hope is that um, through either private or um, or government dollars, we can help uh, make this transition. And you know, right now. There's a lot of pushback in the lobster industry against this technology, uh, but when these federal rules start to um, change the way, you know, coerce changes, uh, we have already seen that here in Massachusetts on a state level um, as part of this federal effort uh, to try to reduce uh, mortalities and serious injuries of right whales. The state of Massachusetts um, just last month imposed um, 
uh, significant new closures on fishing. They have basically imposed a statewide ban, a nearly statewide ban on lobster fishing uh, when the whales are present in our waters. So from February 1st until around mid-May every year, from uh, the border, uh, the northern border of Massachusetts with New Hampshire down south of Cape Cod, um, there won't be lobster fishing in state waters allowed. Um, um, and that in, in a few years will hopefully allow uh, a testing of ropeless fishing. And so we mm -hmm. might uh, see uh, you know, room for more testing and a more eagerness by, on the part of the industry, if indeed that's their only option. Yeah. If you have a question for David, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type in your question. I see a question you want to hear the answer to. Vote for it by clicking the thumbs up. Uh, Stephen says, can you explain what's happening with the Gulf Stream? Is there any linkage to the ice melting in Greenland? And uh, are there any other large ocean currents being impacted by climate change? Great question. Um, uh, I know that I'm billed as uh, the expert here, but I am not a climate scientist. I'm a journalist and filmmaker, uh, but I'll do my best to answer that question. So uh, the warming uh, of our planet, um, which is already warmed roughly uh, about uh, a degree, one degree Celsius, uh, and we're on target to, you know, 1.5, two degrees Celsius, um, in the coming decades. Uh, and we, by the end of the century, if we don't do anything, we're looking at uh, temperatures, a catastrophic increase of temperatures to four degrees Celsius, which is a, uh, a very hellish and very different planet uh, than we live on today. If we, if we get there, even 1.5 degrees uh, will involve all kinds of changes that nobody uh, wants to see especially people living near the coast uh, or near forests um, with greater forest fires and, um, and greater droughts and uh, more powerful hurricanes and rising sea levels. And I'll go on. Among those sig significant changes um, uh, um, from the warming of the planet and the melting of glaciers is the changing of, uh, of major ocean currents like the Gulf Stream or the Labrador uh, current uh, that comes around south uh, from Greenland down uh, along Maritime Canada into the Gulf of Maine. Uh, the Gulf of Maine, by the way, uh, the body of water off New England where we live uh, is warming faster than almost any other body of water on the planet. Um, and uh, the changes in the Gulf Stream are playing into that uh, in, um, in some respects as well. So uh, the, the, the Gulf Stream is being affected by, by essentially uh, movements of other ocean currents. And uh, that uh, is in part because of runoff from increased precipitation and from melting uh, glaciers. Uh, and from uh, just you know shifting um, uh, the shifting ways the oceans work when um, when there's greater amounts of uh, heat uh, in 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 the oceans. Mm. Heidi says uh, this year marked the launch of the oceans decade. The oceans are increasingly under threat from climate change, but also have huge potential to provide solutions. Why aren't the oceans considered more in climate strategy and climate policy? Um, I, I think they are uh, very much considered uh, in our uh, thinking of the oceans are experiencing um, the worst of it. You know, we're seeing uh, the vast majority of carbon dioxide being absorbed by our ocean, uh, our oceans, and that is having a, an effect on all kinds of species. Uh, we're seeing the uh, warming also leading to ocean acidification, um, which is another uh, uh, challenge for the shellfish industry, like uh, the lobster industry. Um, and, um, and, you know, there was uh, just during the Obama administration, one of the controversial things I've written about for the newspaper 
uh, there was um, a protected area um, off of, um, uh, not sure exactly how far off, uh, well off of the coast of Provincetown, Cape Cod, uh, that became the first marine sanctuary uh, on the East Coast um, in this area that uh, where there are these massive uh, underwater uh, mat mountains and sea canyons and all kinds of um, rare and endangered species. Um, and that uh, closure uh, or that creation of the sanctuary involved a closure of uh, commercial fishing, um, although that somewhat got delayed. And then the Trump administration reversed that closure. And now it looks like the Bush, the, the, the Biden administration is uh, about to uh, reverse the Trump's reversal. And so we will probably not see um, um, lo uh, lobster fishing or other kinds of fishing there uh, in the near future. And, uh, and there, the Biden administration has talked about increasing the amount of areas protected in our oceans, and we're likely to see more conservation areas uh, more areas close to fishing where there has been historic overfishing. Um, and uh, this is, you know, obviously something critical that we need to consider um, as more of our oceans uh, are affected by warming and, uh, and other pressures. Mm. Wendell says, do necropsies of right whales reveal ingestion of plastics? Mm. Absolutely. Um, and uh, and sadly, other kinds of human um, chemicals. Uh, uh, there have been tests on um, on whales that have been uh, washed up on shore or brought to shore, and we have found that we are affecting uh, whales in many different ways, uh, whether it's consumption of plastic or whether um, they're uh, somehow ingesting um, these toxic chemicals uh, that we uh, more commonly called, call forever chemicals or PFAS. And these um, you know, are in their blood and in our blood uh, and they just never, they're, they're called forever chemicals because they're so pervasive and they uh, don't break down in the environment. And, uh, it's just, uh, it's just crazy. There's this beautiful book that I recently read that I highly recommend, uh, about plastics and other things. It's called Fathoms. I, I'm, uh, I have no relationship to this author, uh, but, uh, it's a beautiful, uh, book all about, uh, human impacts on whales. Again, if you have a question for David, open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen and type your question there. And if you see a question you want to hear answered, vote for it by clicking the thumbs up. Anne says, are any philanthropic billionaires wanting to fund the replacement of lobster lines with lineless technology? Sorry, can you repeat that one more time? Uh, she wants to know if there are any billionaires who are willing to fund the ropeless fishing gear. Yeah, um, I, I, that that repeats a question earlier. Uh, I am not aware of any billionaires uh, that are uh, that are looking to subsidize the transition, uh, but I do know um, uh, there are lots of or, there are lots of um, uh, advocacy organizations uh, like Oceana, um, uh, like. Uh, the Conservation Law Foundation, uh, like the Center for Biological Diversity and the Humane Society, uh, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, all of these groups have been uh, great uh, advocates, wildlife defenders, defenders of wildlife. Um, they, they've all been, um, you know, uh, trying to raise attention about the plight of the right whale and looking uh, for help in uh, various ways. Uh, and some of them have, I think, raised money from private donors to help uh, subsidize some of uh, the testing of this technology. Yeah, Janet, and, and so I she'd be say, the, yeah. I, I hope some of the billionaires watch 
uh, <laughs> my film entangled and maybe that will inspire yeah. them to help thread the needle between the commercial and the um, uh, and the conservation interests. And I think there are a lot of people, Janet's saying she'd be delighted to pony up and ship in. So there's lots of people maybe who would want to get on and, and be part of that. Don says, what is happening on Cape Ann with lobster uh, fishermen? I live on the Anasquam River and we see si sightings in the bay. Will they be increasing in numbers and an, an upward trajectory? Do you know the answer to that? I don't know. Will there be more lobster? More, more lobster fishermen. Do, doing what? Uh, I guess sorry. fishing. Um, she's saying, what's happening at Camp, Camp Ann with the lobster fishermen? I live on the Anasquam River and see sightings in the bay. Will they be increasing in numbers? Well, at the moment, as far as I know, um, I, I, there might be um, lobster fishing in, um, in certain areas that are not, I, I don't know, yeah, there, there are certain types of lobster fishing, recreational lobster fishing that might still be allowed, especially if it doesn't use um, the dangerous vertical buoy line. Um, that is what causes entanglements. Um, so recreational uh, um, lobstermen who maybe let, maybe uh, go diving and right. basically bring up their traps by hand. Uh, and there are people who do that. Uh, I, I don't think that is, I'm, I'm not sure if that's actually banned right. by the current law, uh, but the at the moment um, there is no lobster fishing um, in Cape Ann that should be happening in state waters uh, because of the new rules. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, our, and the whales are currently uh, in our area. So the vast majority of uh, uh, right whales it come feed on these huge blooms of these copepods known as uh, the, these rice-sized creatures that are called Calanus finmarchicus. And uh, they um, are, are, you know, it's their best feeding grounds, as far as I understand, uh, mainly in Cape Cod Bay, uh, but it extends up through uh, off Gloucester. And, um, and so right now, I, I think we have roughly about half of all known right whales. And the, the, the latest estimate is there there are roughly about 360 uh, right whales remaining um, mm -hmm. down from a population of about three, 480 um, in uh, 2010 or 2011. Yeah, not that long ago. So, yeah. yeah, their population is, has collapsed, but we now have the vast majority of known whales um, or, or, or roughly a majority of known whales in our waters um this time of year and Amazing. so uh so there should not be fishing happening in those areas um we talked earlier about um you know the, the whale deaths being a lot with entanglement or uh, vessel strikes and wendell's wondering about comparing the impact of vessel strikes versus entanglement yeah so uh we have if you go on our website you can see uh, a graphic that compares uh, that compares the numbers, and uh, in the film uh, we have similar graphics that show. Uh, um, but uh, to uh, I'll actually just pull it up while I'm speaking here. Um, but the um, uh, vast uh, majority. So hang on one second. Um, so according to can I share my screen? I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, but uh, between 2010 and 2019, uh, according to the figures we quote from the National Marine Fisheries Service in our film, uh, there were 43 entanglements, um, 14 vessel strikes, and 26 deaths that never uh, had a uh, had a cause um, um, attributed to it. And, uh, and uh, there were no natural deaths. Um, wow. So that just gives you some yeah. sense uh, uh, of how these whales are dying. 
Yeah. Lynn says, how can we use films made about climate change to have a bigger impact, get bigger audiences and create more urgency and emotion about these important issues? Thank you very much for that question. Uh, that's a beautiful softball for me to uh, <laughs> hit. Uh, I would just say that uh, please spread the word about Entangled, uh, our film, and uh, you can watch it. Uh, a shorter ver version of it uh, was broadcast last night, and I think will be broadcast again today uh, on WGBH's The World Channel. And it will also, uh, it's also available the full film on Curiosity Stream um, and uh, and on our Vimeo platform. Um, oh. And so, um, uh, you know, I encourage you to spread the word about the film. Uh, I can put a link in the chat for the full version too. Yeah. You know, um, just speaking to Lynn's question there, uh, Michael Moore, who's a scientist in Woods Hole, has said, if these were land creatures and we saw how they suffer, th there would be outrage. There would be so many people, you know, working to try to save them. And part of that is we don't, and it, it's a terrible uh, death, um, David, as you know, uh, to see these, how these creatures suffer with these entanglements. It's really just heartbreaking. Yeah, and um, and the way they die, and and we, you know, explain this to some extent in the film, um, and we show a necropsy and the horror of you know what these whales experience. But when they get entangled, um, the the they they tend to spin, and it can get stuck in their massive um, flippers, or uh, probably more often, I think, uh, around their um, uh, around uh, in their baleen and lodged in their mouths, and they can carry uh, often, you know, these ropes with heavy, you know, traps, uh, often multiple traps, long distances, hundreds of miles, and they get emaciated. Sometimes uh, they drown instant instantaneously, um, um, you know, because they just can't get up to breathe. Um, um, and they're dragged down because of the weight of, of these trawl lines. Sometimes uh, they carry them for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. And so it can, the, the, the rope can just really um, uh, dig into their, uh, into their blubber and then into their bone um, and cause infections. Um, and it's, you know, uh, a pretty gruesome thing yeah. to witness. And sadly, 85% of right whales have been found to have had uh, entanglements. Uh, and of those, uh, a majority, I think some 60% are estimated to have had uh, multiple, uh, at least two entanglements. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's pretty tough. Yeah. Rob says, would having a ropeless, uh, limited rope season help increase use of newer technology? Um, sorry, say again? Would having a ropeless or limited rope season help increase use of the newer technology? Uh, that's the hope for sure. Um, uh, I just wanna mention, I just dropped in the Vimeo link for the film uh, where folks can watch the film directly, the full film directly as well. Um, uh, but yeah, so part of the idea right now is, you know, we need to reduce the amount of rope in the, in the water column. And, uh, that is, um, you know, that is a challenge. Uh, and Massachusetts has done that, uh, and they took a very controversial step by, uh, reducing, the amount of line when we know whales are here. The challenge is that um, we don't know uh, that the whales aren't here all the time. Uh, they often uh, are not detected um, because they swim under the water uh, and aren't surface feeding. We, we see them now often because they are surface feeding. Uh, we can also detect them in other ways uh, through their sound. Um, and through buoys that um, that that listen for whale sounds, but uh, they are in the Gulf of Maine um, all year round. And so, um, with so few whales left, we are, um, you know, uh, it's incumbent upon us to take 
more action to mm -hmm. protect them. Mm -hmm. So many great questions from the audience. Thank you uh, for your questions. I want to just take a moment here to introduce my colleague, Sandy. Welcome, Sandy. Hi, thank you, Mindy. And thank you to everyone at home for spending so much time with us this afternoon, continuing the spirit of Earth Day. And while we learn from today's expert, reporter and documentary filmmaker, David Abel, GBH remains committed to producing in-depth science programming covering the latest breakthroughs in technology and the deepest mysteries of the natural world and airing important films such as Entangled. And we rely on financial support from members to keep offering these programs and events like this one. And today, when you show your support by making a one-time donation of $75 or by giving $6.25 a month as a GBH sustainer, we'll send you this brand new, beautiful National Audubon Society Birds of North America Flexi Bound Book as our thank you. It is the perfect item for any nature enthusiast. Please visit gbh.org slash support events to make that donation. You can also click on the support link in the Zoom chat tab now or text GBH to 800-492-1111. And there are more options to choose from, including the new National Audubon Society Book of Trees. Giving takes just a few minutes of your time and a few dollars on your credit card. And since we make the process quick and easy, those few minutes now will become hours of informative news, science stories, and inspiring programming you can trust. And if you're already a GBH member, thank you for all that you do. Every dollar our donors give makes a difference in helping us create more science stories, programs, and events on GBH. And today, with a donation of $75, you can receive one of these beautiful books. Simply go ahead and click on the safe and secure link in the chat tab now or text GBH to 800-492-1111. And thanks again for joining us. And now here's Mindy with more of your questions for our expert. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, Elizabeth asked, what organizations are most involved in trying to protect the right whales? So there, uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are a host of organizations that are uh, that have been advocating for the North Atlantic right whale and have filed lawsuits uh, um, against the federal government uh, in one case uh, or in two cases successfully um, um, uh, winning rulings that uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service has. Uh, violated the Endangered Species Act by not doing enough to remove um, uh, uh, rope from the water to reduce entanglements. Um, so uh, the, the, the list, just to iterate them again, includes uh, the Conservation Law Foundation here in Boston, uh, the Center for Biological Diversity, the Humane Society, uh, the NRDC, um, um, who else? Uh, the Wildlife Defenders, um, uh, Max Strahan's group. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what Max's group is called, uh, but he's kind of a, a, a force on his uh, own. Um, and uh, I'm sure I'm leaving out some. So other... you could probably Google, you know, and yeah, get, yeah. get a whole list of, of those organizations. The Center for Coastal Studies. Uh, they I do great work. Yeah. Give a, uh, a mention to them because they have done amazing work uh, for years in, in, um, in, they're at a province town in terms of trying to reduce entanglements. And they have pioneered efforts to, uh, to disentangle whales um, that have been, uh, you know, co uh, covered in rope and they've saved mm -hmm. uh, lots of whales um, from entanglement. Yeah. Uh, IFA uh, is another one. Right. Yeah, very creative and uh, some of the things that they've uh, come up with at Coastal Studies to help, because uh, those whales don't know you're trying to help them. It's a very dangerous job, yeah. Right. Um, Pris Priscilla says, consumers rallied around dolphin safe tuna. Is there any way to promote whale safe lobster uh, at the consumer or major grocery store buyer level? I hope more research can help ropeless technology get better and cheaper for the fishing industry to embrace. Meanwhile, great to hear the state of Massachusetts is taking measures and hope all the Atlantic coastal states and Canada move forward. Not a bad idea, right? Lobster safe, you know. Yeah, yeah, whale safe lobster, a right. Whale safe that, lobster, that, yeah. <laughs> that is 
you know, uh, there, there has been uh, quite a bit of talk about that. Um, and uh, last spring, um, not long after uh, a federal judge ruled uh, that uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service was violating the Endangered Species Act because of uh, not doing enough to reduce entanglement, the um, MSC, the Marine Stewardship Council, uh, which uh, fixes this blue label to a lot of the seafood um, uh, people eat, uh, certifying its sustainability, removed their certification from lobster because of its impact on, uh, on whales and on uh, North Atlantic right whales. And uh, um, uh, there has been other efforts, um, uh, particularly led um, by, and, and it's interesting actually to sort of see the split in the way some of the environmental advocates have approached this. Um, I think a lot of the environmental advocacy groups here in New England um, have tried to, um, you know, take a uh, more measured approach by trying to work with the lobster industry to uh, to ad adopt ropeless fishing and and uh, adopt some other measures like breaking strength rope and um, and reducing the 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 number of ropes that they the number of ropes that they use um, by connecting more more of their traps on individual trawl lines. Um, um, but there is this one group in, in Georgia, which is where the breeding grounds um, of the right whales are. The breeding grounds are from Georgia to uh, uh, Northern Florida. And a group down there has been calling for a boycott on lobster. Um, and, and you do hear that from others. Uh, and there is, uh, um, one man, uh, um, uh, uh, Max Strahan, who I mentioned, who's in the film, uh, who uh, sued the state of Massachusetts saying that any use of vertical buoy line should be illegal. And, um, and he currently uh, uh, has a ruling uh, in his favor and what to do about it is, uh, is going to be adjudicated in June, uh, when a federal judge here in Boston is going to be holding a trial about how to uh, about what what should be done um, and whether the um, vertical buoy line should be uh, made illegal, mm -hmm. and that very well could happen. Um, and uh, that's what what he's going to be arguing and what he has argued. And if he succeeds, that could uh, radically and quickly change all lobster fishing in Massachusetts. Mm. With an, an anonymous attendee who says, I snorkel off a beach in the Marblehead Salem area. Are there any changes taking place in the nearshore ecosystems that are markers of climate change? Um, there are all kinds of uh, um, uh, harbingers, I guess you could say. Uh, uh, reflections of how climate change is, is affecting our uh, ecosystems here in, um, in New England. Um, uh, so my first film, say, in this, in this sort of trilogy of films about how climate change is affecting our oceans here uh, in our region, uh, was called Sacred Cod. And Sacred Cod, um, which was broadcast, as you mentioned, on the Discovery Channel a few years ago, was all about how um, there had been years of overfishing, but the cod, uh, which is uh, um, uh, such a part of our region that we have this wooden cod that we hang from the rafters of the Massachusetts State Legislature. It's what, it's what brought settlers from Europe. It's what uh, brought great wealth to our region here uh, for generations and sustained families all along the coast uh, from Cape Cod up through uh, up through Maine, and um, and uh, about a decade ago, scientists started to notice that their population wasn't bouncing back, and uh, the warming was uh, the chief culprit for why um, cod were not bouncing back. And when their population dropped to what was 
roughly about 4% of what was considered a sustainable fishery, the federal government issued a moratorium on commercial fishing of, uh, of cod, which was you know, dramatic and painful um, and uh, epic for our region. And that was the subject of my first film. Um, and the, the cod population has not really bounced back since then. Um, and again, most scientists attribute that to warming. Uh, with lobster, uh, which was the subject of my next film called Lobster War, we saw in some cases the opposite of that happen. So we, we saw the lobster population collapse uh, because the waters south of Cape Cod, uh, particularly off Rhode Island and Connecticut, New York, um, where there was for, for generations a robust lobster fishery, um, we saw a 90% collapse of the lobster population, which has mainly been attributed to the warming of those waters. Um, but the waters in uh, further north, um, specifically in the Gulf of Maine, um, um, near between Down East Maine and Nova Scotia, uh, this one patch of water known uh, to both countries as the gray zone, uh, because both countries have been uh, claiming this island, the center of the gray zone called Machia Seal Island since the end of the Revolutionary War. Um, and while for hundreds of years, nobody really cared about that island, uh, about a decade ago, when all of a sudden, the warming of the waters uh, created a kind of sweet spot for the, um, uh, for the lobsters, the uh, lobster population in the gray zone exploded. And so all of a sudden, the Canadians who long ceded the waters to the Americans said, those are our waters too, and we're going to fish them. And that led to all kinds of conflict. And that was uh, the film called Lobster War that I made. Um, and while I was making that film, I learned a lot about the issues um, uh, of how lobster lines were affecting whales and also about how climate change was affecting whales. Um, and we've seen uh, in recent um, uh in recent years, the warming of the Gulf of Maine lead to a collapse of Calanus finmarchicus, the, the primary food source of, for right whales. Again, this very small creature um, uh, where there, you know, there are these huge blooms um, now in Cape Cod Bay, uh, but in their summer feeding grounds closer to the Bay of Fundy, uh, the, um, their populations declined substantially, which scientists have attributed to, um, to uh, the warming uh, of the Gulf of Maine. And as a result, the, the whales ended up moving in places, uh, migrating to places in search of food that they'd never been seen before, leading to uh, a, a surge in their, in their uh, mortalities. You're kind of answering the next question. Natalia is asking, do you know whether climate change, ocean warming, and ocean acidification have any effect on plankton populations in the Gulf of Maine? Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. I <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and then Thomas says, I've discussed ropeless technology with Woods Hole staff, and they directed me to the ropeless.org and to Edge Tech that has a ropeless system. It seems that the cost is expensive for the lobster fishermen. Can't the US federal government subsidize the development costs for these systems and have the lobster fishermen pay only the incremental cost? Um, yeah, absolutely. And that's, you know, I think the hope that, um, you know, as these technologies mature and as lobstermen might have fewer options about how they fish, uh, there will be incentives uh, through subsidies um, uh, that will make this uh, more affordable to lobstermen and uh, and help them cover the costs. Right now, lobstermen, um, you know, struggle to make ends meet as it is. I mean, they have huge costs. Uh, they have mortgage payments on their boats that they have to make. They have fuel costs. Uh, they have bait costs. Uh, they have maintenance costs. They have labor costs. There's the volatile nature of uh, the price of, uh, of lobster. Then there are things like pandemics that, you know, completely, you know, uh, change all their, their variables. And so, um, you know, they haven't had it easy. 
and we should all be empathetic with you know what the, these you know uh, these folks who feed us you know and you know there's demand for their services and we want to see uh, the lobster industry is a huge part of our economy it brings in half a billion dollars a year in in revenue just to Maine and um, is responsible for an additional billion dollars uh, of economic uh, activity in Maine. Uh, and that doesn't include, you know, Massachusetts and New Hampshire, where there's also uh, significant um, uh, lobster fishing. And there, there are huge parts of our economy. We want to see that continue. Um, and, you know, if we were to lose the, the, those fisheries, there would be substantial economic consequences. So hopefully there is a way to uh, ease their transition to a more sustainable kind of fishing that will have less of an impact on our uh, marine mammals. And, and I should just say that uh, we're talking mainly about uh, entanglements of North Atlantic right whales, but uh, these vertical buoy lines also affect uh, humpback whales and other uh, other kinds of whales and other marine mammals like uh, like Kemp's Ridley turtles and other endangered turtles. David, is there a place people can sign up if they want to volunteer to help out in any way? Is there any anything that you know of? Um, I, I'm not sure. That's a good question. I think you'd have to put that to some of these organizations. Some of the organizations, yeah. So I know, uh, John, for example, the International Foundation of Animal Welfare mm -hmm. uh, uh, on Cape Cod has these rescue teams that frequently go out to rescue right. stranded marine mammals all over mm -hmm. Cape Cod, for example, right. where uh, there, I think, are more strandings than, of marine mammals than any other part of the planet. Just because Hot spot, of the, yeah. Just because of the shape of the uh, 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 and the ocean currents and their proximity, and so uh, I I don't know if they're actively recruiting, uh, but I know that they do have volunteers uh, yeah. uh, who help out. Yeah, I thought it'd be a good place to start. John wants to know: Are there right whales in the Pacific Ocean, and if so, how are they doing? Uh, that's a great question. So there are other kinds of uh, right whales, and that's why I've been careful to talk about the North Atlantic right whale. Um, there are southern right whales, um, which um, has a substantially different, uh, they're, they're, they're cousin of the North Atlantic right whale. They're technically a different species, but they look very similar, um, nearly identical. It's hard to tell the difference, except for the fact that when you see a southern right whale, they tend to look a lot healthier than um, their cousins here. And, um, and their population has flourished. There are, I believe, um, their, their population is well into the thousands. Um, um, I, I'm hesitant to quote a, a number, but uh, there is a robust Southern right whale population. Um, there is a Pacific right whale, um, which has had, um, which, which is a much smaller population is also uh, seriously threatened. Um, and so I, I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, uh, but uh, that is also uh, an endangered, uh, endangered species. Um, Heidi says, would you care to comment on the film Seaspiracy? <laughs> I'm not familiar with it. I don't know. Maybe you are. <laughs> you know, this is a this is a film that's currently on Netflix that um, that has been criticized uh, um, for a, a bunch of inaccuracies and for uh, hyping threats. And I I haven't watched the full film. I, I watched the beginning of it, and um, I I just I don't. For me, when the filmmaker puts themselves at the center of the film. Uh, it always kind of turn, turns me off. And so um, so I couldn't quite make it through the full film because I just <laughs> sort of felt like it was a lot of, there was a lot of egotism in it. Um, and it seemed to me more about the filmmaker uh, in some ways. So I haven't actually um, watched the full film so I can't really say more. Yeah, another question of going back to subsidies for, for lobster fishermen, they're saying when the government asks the lobster boat owners to stop fishing, do they offer compensation? Are subsidies like those offered to farmers also offered to lo the lobster industry? Um, um, 
currently not really. Um, there have been government uh, um, rescue packages for fishermen. Certainly during the pandemic, um, uh, fishermen have uh, benefited from, uh, lobstermen in particular have benefited uh, from government uh, assistance uh, and loans uh, or grants. Um, uh, the, when I was talking about with um, ground fishermen uh, or cod fishermen um, during the moratorium on cod fishing um, that took effect uh, six or seven years ago, um, we, uh, there was also a lot of government assistance to help them. Uh, but uh, annual subsidies, uh, as far as I know, don't exist uh, as they do for the agricultural industry. But as I was hinting at, it's not out of the realm of reason that we might see uh, some form of assistance like that uh, to enable the lobster fishery to make the transition. Let's bring in my colleague, Sandy, uh, one more time. <clears throat> Excuse me, Sandy. Hi, Mindy. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, financial support from our donors makes opportunities for gathering and connection and learning possible. And we're here for you as you've been here for us. And we hope that we can count on you again. With a $6.25 a month sustaining gift of support to GBH or $75 all at once, we'll send you right away the National Audubon Society Birds of North America Flexi Bound Book. It is your comprehensive guide to birding complete with full color photographs or when you go to gbh.org slash support events, you can also choose from other options, including the National Audubon Society Book of Trees. Just click the chat link to be brought to our site or text GBH to 800-492 one 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 to make a donation and if you're already a gbh member thanks again for all your support now more than ever your commitment makes all the difference support from all members in our community keeps us strong and helps us deliver great programs and events just like today and here's mindy with some final words right. thanks andy before we wrap up david um there's there's it's, it can be so overwhelming and so depressing when we look around what's happening with climate change but there are things people can do Right. Watch the film is one. Um, recycle. I mean, the, the, we have a little more power than we might think uh, against this issue, correct? Um, yeah. I mean, you know, with, again, as I mentioned, with this particular issue, um, with right whales, at least, um, we know what the problem is, and it's us. Um, and we know what the solution is, and that is trying to prevent vessel strikes and reduce entanglement in fishing gear. Uh, and if we did those things uh, effectively, we would hopefully uh, end uh, this problem. In the, and we've already seen that this species can rebound. Um, and uh, to, to maybe end on a hopeful note, um, this year, the um, just in this, the calving season that ended uh, uh, um, in March, uh, we saw the largest number of right whales born uh, that we've seen in five or six years. Uh, so there were uh, some 18 right whales that were born uh, this year. Um, and unfortunately, two of them died already. Um, um, uh, but uh, that is good. The good news that we had 18 births, um, which was better than in 2018, uh, when for the first time in anyone's memory, there were zero births. Yeah, yeah. And that was, uh, that was uh, something that rang the alarm bells. Uh, but to, uh, as we mentioned at the end of the film, um, to, to leaven that hope with a do dollop of reality, unfortunately, these whales to, to stave off extinction and to remain uh, sustainable need to be producing roughly twice the number of calves that were born this year. So roughly about 30 calves a, a year need to be born to, um, you know, to compensate for the deaths. Right. David Abel, thanks so much for uh, being with us today. And thank you. I'm sorry we didn't get to all of your questions. Uh, feel free to visit David's website if you'd like to connect with him. And of course, uh, check out the film. Um, thank you again, David. And uh, thank you all for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it.